Hello and welcome to Unit 9, World War I. In this unit, we are going to see the incredible destruction and bloodshed that the First World War brought to the entire world. And yes, this is indeed a world war because Europe had um, spread out all around the world, extending its tentacles to every continent um, through imperialism. When Europe went to war, it would drag all of its colonies to war too. And so this first global conflict, the first one in human history, would be terrible indeed. It would be the most terrible conflict the world had ever seen. It would be a thoroughly modern war with thoroughly modern weapons. So we've got lots to talk about, so let's jump right in. The learning objectives for this unit are, number one, describe the causes of World War I. Number two, explain why the war was so different from everything that had come before. And number three, understand the scope and the basic narrative of the war. Which brings us finally to the Great War, or World War I. It was known as the Great War to contemporaries. They, of course, didn't know that we'd be back at it again just a couple of decades after this by having another war. Um, at the time, contemporaries described it as the war to end all wars. It was massive. It was one of the deadliest conflicts in history, with an estimated 9 million combatants and 7 million civilian deaths as a direct result of the war, while resulting in genocides and finally culminating in the 1918 influenza epidemic, which caused another 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide. The Great War was absolutely devastating. It's also a war that's heavily covered by photography. So we have, and film, motion picture film for that matter, we have so much more evidence of just how horrible and what life was like during the war. This is actually an image of a Canadian walking across no man's land after the Battle of Passchendaele. World War I was by far the most costly war to date. Over 10 million soldiers killed, over 20 million crippled. Um, overall, it led to the mobilization of more than 70 million military personnel. World War I also brought with it a new type of warfare, trench warfare. Uh, trenches were long, deep ditches dug as protective defenses, and although we do see them used in a few conflicts prior to World War I, never before had they become so central to the way conflict um, unfolded. And life in these trenches was absolutely atrocious. Um, for much of World War I, there was a stalemate from both sides. Uh, they, the two sides each would have their own trenches separated by a swath of land that became known as No Man's Land. Um, no Man's Land was impossible to cross. Um, it was covered in barbed wire and mud and shell casings. And if you died out there, your body might be left to rot for a very long time. Living in the trenches meant living with lice and trench foot, which is a, a horrible condition that happens to your feet when you keep them in water too long. Um, it's surrounded by vermin such as rats and the stench ever pervading of death. Every once in a while, one of your commanders would say, it's time for an attack, and you would be forced to go over the top, scrambling across no man's land until you meet your inevitable end. This was what World War I was like. World War I was a thoroughly modern war. It was the first war with widespread use of the machine gun. It was a war that used poison gas. It was a war that saw the introduction of tanks for the very first time. It was a war that saw the introduction of airplanes and even submarines. This was a thoroughly modern conflict. The final thing that really makes World War I different from anything else that had happened before this time was that it was truly a global war. Because Europe had set up colonies all around the world, it meant that when they went to war, their colonies went to war too. And so here you see a map of the world. And everywhere that you see that is not gray, everything that is colored either green or that uh, yellowish color, uh, is at war with one another. Um, the only places that are neutral technically are the gray areas. And even then, they're not really neutral. Let's be honest here. The neutral areas are being forced to take sides on who they trade with. They're walking a very, very fine line. Um, and so in many ways, they are still part of the war too. They can't completely avoid the war and they're affected by the war in many other ways. Certainly economically, they're affected by the war. So this is a truly global conflict in every sense of the word.
Okay, so just a quick overview of the two sides of World War I. Um, the, the two sides are generally called the Allies on one side and the Central Powers on the other side. So the Allies included Britain and all the Commonwealth countries, so that includes Canada because we're a Commonwealth country, formerly part of the British Empire. It also included France, Russia, Italy, the newly formed country of Italy, Japan, interestingly enough, because of course I, I hinted at Japan was on the process of industrialization, becoming a power of its own right. Um, so they were involved in the war on the Allied side. And the United States. Now the United States doesn't join until 1917, and that's important too, that we'll get to that a little bit later on. But that's the Allied side. On the other side, we have the newly formed country of Germany. We also have its former rival, Austria-Hungary. Uh, is on their side. And we also have the Ottoman Empire, who was also a rival, former rival of Austria-Hungary. So all these guys were rivals with one another and Bulgaria. Um, interestingly, on the central power side, you have these big empires. Um, Germany even considered itself an empire. So it was the German Empire, uh, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. And of course, um, these uh, multi-ethnic, multinational empires were already struggling on the eve of World War I, and World War I will ultimately destroy them. The Austria-Hungarian Empire will not survive World War I, and neither will the Ottoman Empire. And the war all technically is the fault of this guy, Gavrilo Princip. Gavrilo Princip was a Serbian nationalist. So Serbia, or at least the part of, part of Serbia, was a part of the Austrian Empire. And Austria was dealing with all kinds of nationalistic movements, including Serbia. And Gavrilo Princip essentially was a terrorist. And what he did was, is he assassinated the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, along with his wife, Sophie, um, uh, and in doing so, he set off a chain reaction which would drag the entire world into conflict. Now, how that actually happens uh, deserves a little bit more explanation. So to understand how Gavril Princip could set off a chain reaction that leads to World War I, I think we need to look at the root causes of World War I. And there are four main reasons. Number one is the alliance system. Uh, number two is nationalism. Number three is patriotism. And the final um, factor is militarism. And I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. So one of the main reasons why World War I takes place is because of the alliance system. And this is how Gavril Princip's uh, assassination of the royal family spins out of control and ends up causing a domino effect, which involves every country in Europe. Uh, by 1914, European powers had organized themselves into two major alliances, the Triple Alliance, which included Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, and also the Triple Entente, which included France, Russia, and Britain. Incidentally, Italy would actually switch sides shortly after the beginning of the war. Um, now, there were also many smaller alliances between individual countries as well, too. Um, so when Gavril Princip um, uh, shot the royal family in Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary immediately blamed the country of Serbia, which, as we said, is, is down here, because, of course, um, uh, the terrorists really wanted to unite um, uh, this area here into one country of Serbia. And Austria-Hungary looked at it as a, as a good chance to not only exact revenge on Serbia, but also to sort of uh, reclaim a little bit of their glory day. So they eagerly declared war on Serbia after the assassination. Now the problem is, is that Serbia had allied itself with Russia. Um, Russia did not want to see Austria-Hungary become more powerful at the expense of Serbia, and so when Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, Russia came to their defense. Germany, of course, being allied with Austria-Hungary, declared war on Serbia as well. France, who was, who was allied with Russia, declared war when um, Russia got involved. So you can see what happens, a domino effect. Suddenly, country after country is dragged into the conflict. Um, so what are some of the main problems of the alliance system then? Well, one of the main problems is, is that more aggressive countries can afford to be reckless since they know that they can count on support. In this instance, the aggressive country is Austria-Hungary. They're really not as powerful as they once were, even decades ago. Um, instead, Germany has become much, much more powerful. Um, Germany, um, overnight, because it was already an industrialized region of Europe, uh, became, as we have already said, um, a major, major power in Europe. And... Um, Austria-Hungary was not so much anymore, um, but Austria-Hungary was eager to sort of reclaim some of that glory, and they knew that Germany had their back, and so they can afford to be a little bit more reckless, and they can immediately react to the assassination of their royal family by declaring war against Serbia.
On the other hand, less aggressive countries, and in this case, Germany was actually less aggressive at the beginning of World War I, um, worry that if they don't help, then they'll be left vulnerable in the next crisis. So perhaps in uh, years to come, France decides to invade Germany. And if that happens and they didn't support Austria-Hungary, well then, who's going to have their back? So all of this is what leads us into World War I. The next major factor uh, which leads to World War I is nationalism. So nationalism has been spreading like a virus throughout Europe ever since the French Revolution. And competition between nations has been building throughout the 19th century, particularly with respect to imperialism. There is also the problem of Germany. So Germany doesn't appear until 1871. And as I've already said, when it does appear overnight, it becomes this massively powerful country just because of all the little independent parts of it. When you combine them together, kind of like how, you know, the, you know, Power Rangers can can join together to become a super big, powerful Power Ranger. If you watch the Power Rangers when you were a kid. Well, similarly, once you get all these little German speaking countries together and you make them into one big country, suddenly Germany's really powerful. And this really upset the balance of power in Europe. And this creates this unease, this tension that will ultimately build until we get to World War I. So tied to the concept of nationalism is patriotism. And patriotism really implies one's loyalty to your nation. And it's at a real high point by the time we get to the late 19th, early 20th century. And there's a bunch of reasons why this is the case. But suffice to say, part of it is the fact that um, people are uh, much more involved in their countries than ever before in the political life of their countries. By the time we get to the late 19th century, in most cases, most men um, can vote in elections. Um, women might not be able to vote for a few more decades, but men can vote now at this point. And also in many countries have adopted the principle of universal education. So all kids are going to school and they're all essentially learning the same things. This is a time of widespread literacy. Newspapers and propaganda reinforce this idea that we're all in it together and that only together as a nation can we defeat the enemy. Which brings us to the next point, that patriotism usually implies that the enemy is evil and something other than human. So, for example, take a look at the poster at the bottom. That was how the Allies depicted Germans. Uh, they were like mad brutes. Uh, they were, you know, apes and they were going to destroy Europe and all civilization. And if we didn't band together, it would be horrible. Whereas in the upper right, you see how Germans depicted themselves. So that's a poster trying to encourage German young men to sign up. And it has a German man protecting his family, his wife and his child. And the idea is that you had to do your part for the country. On the left, on the upper uh, left there, you see actually a French Canadian poster encouraging them to sign up for the war. And it says French Canadians enroll um, and is trying to call not only on their loyalty to Canada, but also their loyalty to France as well. And it says our first line of defense is in France. The next uh, factor in World War I is really a cultural factor. Um, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, across Europe, there was a widespread culture of militarism. What that means is that um, things to do with the military were romanticized. Uniforms and service to one's nation were romanticized. It was just considered the height of being a good citizen was to be part of the military. All major powers had uh, some form of conscription except for Britain, which meant that you know everyone was expected at one point in their lives to do military service, to perform military service. So it was really highly regarded. If you want a further example of this culture of militarism, look no further than these uh, pictures of the kings of uh, the major European powers. So George V of Britain, he's the King of Britain, or Nicholas II, the Tsar of Russia, or Wilhelm II, the Kaiser of Germany. All three of these guys are dressed in military uniforms because that is what was considered the height of respectability. I mean, in many respects, they look like a third world dictator in these pictures, but this was um, uh, uh, just how widespread a culture of militarism existed in Europe at that time. So with all this pent up patriotism and nationalism, it's not surprising that when war finally broke out in August 1914, there was widespread enthusiasm for the war. Europe hadn't seen a major war in decades, and there was thought that this was probably a good thing. Let's get all the tension out of the air, let our young men go off and have some fun and, and have some camaraderie and brotherhood, and, you know, it'll all be a good thing. There was widespread belief as well that the war would be done by Christmas, and, and so, you know, we were only going to be going for a short period of time. Of course, the reality of the war was much, much different. <laughs> 
The reality of World War I was that it was mostly a stalemate for a very long time, and we entered into a new world of trench warfare. The trenches were the most horrible places you can imagine. They were filled with mud. The soldiers had to deal with lice and trench foot. Uh, they had to deal with the uh, ever constant stench of dead bodies. Um, there was a very limited effectiveness of actually going over the top and actually launching an attack. Um, most of your soldiers would die in the no man's land trying to cross it. And so both sides basically just dug in. Um, there was at the same time, both sides inflicted massive casualties by artillery. Those are the big guns that would essentially drop bombs, uh, machine guns and poison gas. The reality of war also was that this was a different type of war. In World War I, we have the concept of total war. Total war means that civilians play an important role in the war effort. It's not just soldiers fighting. Everyone is fighting. Um, in the war, we start to see things like the government rationing and control of the economy. So here you see a picture, save a loaf a week, help win the war. Um, or food, buy it with thought, cook it with care, use less wheat and meat, buy local foods, serve just enough, use what is left, don't waste it. There was this idea that we all had to come together as a nation to support the war effort. And of course, civilians would be also killed in unprecedented numbers during World War I too. On the home front, we see massive amounts of propaganda and also an effort to deal with what were called internal enemies. So for countries like Canada and the, and the United States, this would be for uh, German Canadians or German Americans. Uh, so German Canadians were considered suspect and they were actually rounded up and put into internment camps. And here you see a camp in Alberta where German Canadian men's were, men were, were forced to go. Um, also, we uh, had so many soldiers going abroad to fight in the war that by 1917, there were massive labor shortages, and this resulted in a massive societal shift. Women were asked to come into the workforce in greater numbers than ever before, and this would start a slow movement towards the women's rights movement. Uh, so here you see an image of women working in a munitions factory in Quebec in 1917. And overall, all these changes would eventually lead to women benefiting in a number of ways. First of all, um, the same thing would happen in World War II, where women would be called to enter into the workforce. And slowly but surely, it would become more and more acceptable for women to also earn income as well, too. Also, eventually, by the end of World War I, in Canada and other places, women would earn the right to vote. While the war was being fought all around the world, we see on the Western Front in Europe some of the largest battles um, and some of the greatest defeats. The Battle of Verdun and the Battle of the Somme were French and British victories, but at a huge cost. Over 700,000 soldiers died at Verdun and some 1 million dead at the Somme. All of this essentially was still resulting in what was largely a stalemate. And by 1917, we even started to see widespread mutinies in French soldiers. The war, suffice to say, by 1917 was not going very well for anyone. However, 1917 would actually become a turning point in the war for two major reasons. The first major reason was the Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution would have a profound effect on the war because Russia was one of the major combatants in the war. They were also the major combatant on the other side of Germany, on the eastern side of Germany. Russia, of course, was allied with France and Britain, and the war was deeply unpopular in Russia. Um, the Russian armies were terribly equipped. There are stories of them going into battle without proper guns. Um, and much of the uh, Russian populace wanted out of the war. And the Russian Revolution um, uh, almost immediately ended Russian involvement in the war. We saw the Tsar executed and his family executed. A new communist government came into power and they withdrew from the war in March of 1918. Now this could be for Germany a major um, you know, chance for them to turn the war around. However, that brings us to the second major reason why 1917 was a turning point, the entry of the United States into the war. So uh, the United States had actually spent most of the war on the sidelines. And this may strike you as surprising given that America nowadays tends to be very forward-facing, involved in everything around the world, meddling in 
you know, conflicts and affairs everywhere. But at the time, America was extremely isolationist. Um, this was the general public feeling that America shouldn't get involved in other people's conflicts. Um, World War One, the Great War at the time was generally considered a European conflict and Europe's problem. Let them deal with it. Um, that's not to say that there wasn't still a fair bit of support within the country um, uh, for Britain in particular. Woodrow Wilson, the American president, generally favored um, America getting involved in the war, but it just wasn't politically realistic for him. So what America did do was try to support Britain and France in other ways. They did so by lending them money. They also did so by um, turning all their factories on to uh, supply them during the war. Um, However, Germany felt that eventually, sooner or later, America would get into the war. They felt that the involvement in America was inevitable. And they also wanted to stop the flow of trade um, coming from America into Europe. And so Germany began to use submarines to sink um, American supply ships and even some ocean liners, such as the British ocean liner Lusitania in 1915, um, in order to try to uh, stop America supporting the war. But in the flip side of this, this actually started to turn public opinion against Germany and increase more widespread support among the American public for joining the war. One of the final straws was the Zimmerman telegram, which was a um, coded telegram, which was sent by the German um, uh, ambassador named a German diplomat named Zimmerman to Mexico um, and it was intercepted and was decoded and essentially what it was saying it was promising to Mexico that if Mexico um, launched a war against the United States that um, uh, Germany would um, uh, would support them in that and, um, and a similar telegram was was uh, um, also uh, sent to uh, Japan as well and so this was a, um, a huge, huge big deal when it happened, and it really turned the tide. And in 1917, America finally declares war on, um, on uh, Germany. And, and this really changes things. First of all, the other countries were exhausted by 1917. Their, their economies had been, you know, just devastated by fighting the war for all these years. They had a low morale. Um, they had lost so many soldiers at this point in time. And America was fresh. They had sat the war out for the most part. Also, in the years um, since the Industrial Revolution, America had slowly but surely had been transformed. It had become an industrial powerhouse. And outside of Europe, it was absolutely becoming the most powerful country in the world. And when America joins the war, fresh with all of its factories and stuff, it definitely makes it a turning point. So on November 11th, 1918, all fighting stopped and World War I came to an end. Um, America's entry into the war really did mean a turning point. Uh, Germany uh, just did not have it left in them to fight anymore. The Ottoman Empire essentially fell apart and disintegrated and Germany was all by themselves. Um, and this finally would lead to um, all the countries sitting down and enacting peace. Unfortunately for the way history turned out, the victors, in this case the United States, uh, Britain and France, um, were uh, really um, in a mood to uh, punish Germany for the war. So really at the end of World War I, there is only one country on the central power side that's left intact, and that's Germany. And the victors were basically in no mood to be nice to Germany. The Treaty of Versailles, which uh, officially ends the war and signed in Paris in 19, 1919, uh, blamed Germany effectively for the war. Now, as we have already talked about, the causes of World War I are really complicated. And by no stretch of the imagination could you argue that Germany somehow was the massive aggressor in World War I at the beginning of it. Um, perhaps you could say that Austria-Hungary was, they were sort of keen to have a war with Serbia, um, but uh, not Germany for sure, and certainly not any of the other European countries. World War I is really a war that everyone just sort of falls into. So it was a little bit uh, disingenuous to blame Germany for it all. The problem is, is that um, France and Britain had gone into such incredible amounts of debt that they needed help to pay it back. Germany had also gone into debt, but 
course, Germany had lost the war. Um, so after uh, the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was forced to give up all kinds of territory. It was really humiliating. And they were also forced to make huge reparation payments to the victors, uh, to Britain and France. And Germany, of course, could not really afford to do them at all. Um, Germany was uh, told that they weren't allowed to have an army anymore. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of really sort of punitive measures put against Germany. And as we'll see with the next video podcast, all of this essentially means that war, again, will be inevitable in Europe, that um, the Treaty of Versailles did not at all ensure peace. In fact, it did the exact opposite. So other than the fact that World War I, of course, was going to lead to a rematch in World War II just a couple of decades later, what are some of the other consequences coming out of the First World War? Well, first of all, it did signal the end once and for all for those two big major empires, the end of the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. These big empires, which in some cases had survived since the Middle Ages, now were broken apart into individual little countries, never to exist again. Uh, so we'll see the birth of modern Turkey, Austria, Hungary, etc., and many of the Balkan countries. This, of course, was going to have profound um, impact in the decades to come and will continue to be sorted out during the Second World War. Just as the world was getting used to the idea of peace, it also had to deal with the flu pandemic of 1918, the Spanish flu, which by some accounts killed as many or way more people than the war had itself. Up to 50 million people around the world died from the flu. It was exasperated by the fact that soldiers were returning home from all over the place, bringing the flu with them. Uh, it was uh, a terrible tragedy on top of what the world had already been through with four years of bloody war. There were many political consequences coming out of the First World War. We see the rise of the Soviet Union, which we're going to be talking about in much more detail next week. We see essentially a brand new map of Europe with the destruction of those large empires. There's also plenty of economic consequences. All the countries involved in the war had essentially racked up their credit cards paying for the war effort. Well, that money is going to need to be paid back. And the issues with respect to who's paying it back and the reparations expected from Germany, all of this is going to contribute to the Great Depression just 10 years later. And finally, there are major social consequences coming out of the war. First of all, there is the reality of what we had been through. There is no hiding the fact that that had been a very different war. Soldiers returning home were not the same young men who had left in the first place. We also had the reality that the position of women in society had fundamentally changed. We now had women who had entered into the workplace. Now, in most cases, they were expected to return home once the men came home from the war front, but there are some things that just cannot be put back into the bottle. For example, we will start to see women's suffrage achieved in most countries shortly after the First World War. Uh, in Canada, it will be achieved at the end of World War War, uh, World War One, for example. So that's it for our discussion on World War One. Next week, we will be starting our new module, the final module of the course, Module Four, and we'll begin that by actually stepping back in time and talking a little bit about World War One again. We're going to go back to the turning point of 1917 and an examine in much more detail the Russian Revolution. Coming out of the Russian Revolution, we're also going to talk about what the 1920s were like. That first decade after the First World War, the Roaring Twenties, we're going to talk about the cultural changes, the economic changes, and the rise of things like fascism. All to come next week with the beginning of Module 4. Till then, everyone.